Kia ora koutou. welcome to this month's uh, seminar that's going to be uh, presented as part of the seminar series. So I'm um, uh, Liam Witherspoon from the University of Auckland. Uh, I've got the pleasure of chairing this session. And to to today, we've got uh, Cecile de Hermit from University of Waikato, who's going to talk to capturing the full complexity of post-disaster freight disruptions in Aotearoa, New Zealand. So Cecile's been uh, involved in in, in Quakeville for a while. So she's a she's a senior lecturer in logistics and supply chain management at the Waikato Management School in Hamilton. And the research focuses on supply chain resilience and freight movements in the aftermath of major disruptive events. Prior to coming to Waikato, uh, Cecile was 10 years in, in corporate banking and international business overseas in France and Germany. She then moved to Australia to complete an MBA and then a PhD before coming over here to join us all. So really great to have Cecile here uh, to present. Just a reminder, please, to uh, make sure you mute yourself, everyone. You can ask questions using the Q&A and there'll be time at the, again, at the end for us to work through that. So over to you, Cecile. Thank you, Liam. So Kia ora koutou. Uh, as Liam mentioned, I am a senior lecturer in logistics and supply chain management at the University of Waikato. And my research focuses on supply chain resilience and more specifically on freight moving or not moving after a major disruptive event. And I am a qualitative researcher. And today I'm going to talk about the complexity underlying post-disaster freight operations. This project aligns with the interdisciplinary program number three, so IP3. And IP3 focuses on transport resilience, including transport system modeling, decision-making under uncertainty and post-disaster logistics and supply chain management operation, which is exactly what I'm going to talk about today. I would like to start with a few acknowledgements. Uh, uh, Quick core first, uh, uh, because they are funding this research project and I am very grateful for that. Uh, Liam Witherspoon, the co-leader of the IP3 program, for his ongoing support and what I would call his chronic curiosity and enthusiasm for all kinds of research. Uh, my student, uh, Yuping Queen, who started this project and put so much effort and so much heart into it. Uh, uh, Yuping conducted all the interviews and started the analysis of the data, but uh, she had to put her research on hold for personal reasons. So I took over, but when uh, Yuping comes back, she will, she will complete the project in her own way. And Nadia Trent, uh, uh, my colleague from the Waikato Management School, who helped me make sense of the quantitative research on transport complexity. And given that I am not a modeler, it was very, very helpful. So now, let me tell you a story. Imagine an enthusiastic truck driver that regularly travels between Christchurch and Timaru. That's 160, 170 kilometers. Our truck driver usually needs about two hours. But you've got a major, dis major disruptive event happening, say something like the Canterbury flooding in 2021. And that's actually what, uh, what, is, what this map is about. And this caused major infrastructure damage to the roads and the bridges. And in blue, you've got the alternative road available. That's 900 additional kilometers and 11 additional hours of travel time. So instead of two hours, it takes 13 hours to travel between Christchurch and Timau. So you bet that our truck driver is not that enthusiastic anymore. So when a natural disaster, a natural hazard happens, you've got a series of effects that 
ripple across the flight system. And this creates a lot of complexity. And it is actually much more complex than what you've got on the slide here. And we wanted to capture this complexity. We wanted to understand what happens. In the literature, this complexity has mostly been investigated by using simulation models. And I know that there are a few engineers here, so nothing wrong with modeling. But as the engineers know too well, mathematical models that replicate the reality are difficult to construct. And that's because data that represents the reality is not always, not always available. And because you might not have the computational power requested. So mathematical models are simplified representations of the reality. And despite these limitations, qualitative research has barely been used to make sense of the complexity of post-disaster flight systems. So that's the approach that we took. We wanted to qualitatively represent the complexity of a post-disaster flight system. And to do this, we used the theory of constraints. The theory of constraints became very, very popular in the 1980s with a series of business books written by someone called Goldratt. That's him here. And the theory of constraints is a systems thinking methodology that was developed initially to improve factory operations. So to deal with bottlenecks in production operations. But now it's commonly used in all business sectors. So not only in production. And it's commonly used to improve the performance of a system, any kind of system. The theory of constraints has also been widely applied by academics. And there are now more than 1,000 academic papers on the theory of constraints or using the theory of constraints. And on the slide here, you've got only a very small number of them. In New Zealand, the specialist of the theory of constraints is Vicky Mabin from Victoria. And her work is actually recognized internationally. The theory of constraints is based on the fundamental concept of constraint, which is defined as the factor that limits the performance of a system relative to its goal. And the constraints can be many, many things. It can be a physical resource with not enough capacity. It can be market related, it can be policy related, it can be product related, and so on and so forth. Basically, the theory of constraints says that there are many constraints within a system and that there are interdependent relationships, so cause and effect relationships between them. And then it goes one step further, and it says that most constraints originate from a limited number of root causes. So if you identify and if you address these root causes, you should be able to improve the performance, uh, the performance of a system as a whole. So that's the theory of constraints. And that has been applied in many different management fields, actually more or less all management fields, but not in freight transport. It has never been implied to make sense of the complexity of a freight transport system. Which brings me to our research objectives. 
So first, we wanted to establish the value of the theory of constraints to investigate the complex mechanisms underlying post-disaster threat disruptions. And then we wanted to capture and visualize this complexity. To address these objectives, we talked to people. So Yuping conducted 20 semi-structured interviews with key stakeholders. And I will tell you more about the, uh, the stakeholders shortly. We analyzed the data qualitatively by conducting a root cause analysis that follows the rules and the requirements prescribed uh, by the theory of constraints. And this analysis enabled us to identify the multiple constraints that affect transport functionality, the cause and effect relationships between these elements, the impacts on freight performance, and the root causes. And we captured all this within a single diagram. So a diagnostic map called a current reality tree. A current reality tree is one of the tools prescribed by the theory of constraints. And this is a tool that captures the complexity of a system. So that captures the underlying mechanisms affecting the performance of a system. And it is often said that this is the tool that opens a system's black, block, black box. So bear with me. I'm going to show you our current reality tree shortly. But before, a few words about the context of this study. So obviously we focused on what happens in the wake of a natural hazard and we focused on New Zealand and more specifically on the domestic freight movements in New Zealand. And we also focused on a specific industry sector, so namely fresh fruit and veggies. And this sector is relevant, well, not only because it's, it's critical to the New Zealand economy, but also because fresh fruit and veggies have a limited shelf life, which means that keeping them fresh and sellable depends on a well-functioning freight system. You've got four main actors in the fruit and veggie sector. So the growers, the distributors, the retailers, and the transporters. And we had interview participants representing all these stakeholders. So now, what did we find? That's a quick overview first. So we identified 30 constraints that affect the functionality of transport, 40 cause and effect relationships between these elements, four ultimate impacts on freight performance, and eight root causes. And as I mentioned before, we captured all this within a single diagram. So what I called a current reality tree, or that's what the theory of constraints calls a current reality tree. And that's our current reality tree. And that's what came out of the interview data and out of the root cause analysis. And I'm fully aware that this is too small for you to read, so I'm going to zoom in shortly. But before, I wanted to show you how we have structured the content. So first of all, a current reality tree should be read from the bottom to the top. So we've got the natural hazard at the bottom, so here in green, and we've got the ultimate impacts on freight performance in orange at the top. In the middle, in blue here, we've got the direct impacts. So road closures, and the unavailability of the Cook Strait Ferry services. 
we only have impacts on road transport and the, the ferry services because the other modes are not used to transport fresh fruit and veggies in New Zealand. So the fact that the other modes of transport are available or not available after an event is not part of our story. But the reason why they are not used is part of the story. And I'm coming back to this shortly. In yellow, you've got a series of cascading effects. And in gray, you've got what we call the exacerbating factors. So the exacerbating factors in the New Zealand freight system and the specific characteristics of fresh fruit and veggies that exacerbate the transport disruptions. And when you've got an ellipse, like here, for example, that's because there is a combined effect. And the elements that are uh, uh, outlined in red, like here, here, are the root causes. So now I'm going to zoom in. So first on the existing constraints in the New Zealand freight system, then on the specific characteristic of fresh fruit and veggies, and finally on the impacts on freight performance. So let's start with the existing constraints in the New Zealand freight system. So you've got six root causes related to the limitations of the New Zealand freight system. So first of all, two are related to the limitations of rail and coastal shipping in New Zealand. So rail and coastal shipping offer limited frequency of service. And you've got multiple handling points. So goods need to be transferred from one mode to the next, which leads to longer transit times, which makes rail and coastal shipping uncompetitive and leads to the over-reliance on road transport. At the same time, the quality of the road infrastructure in New Zealand is not that good. And there is not much redundancy in the road system. So not many alternative roads or not many alternative options that are adapted to extensive uh, freight transport. Two additional problems are the shortage of labor, in particular, the shortage of truck drivers and the fact that the Cook Strait ferries are at the end of their working life. So leading to extensive repairs and maintenance, which makes the ferries and the ferry capacity regularly unavailable. Now, let's have a look at the left hand on side of the current reality tree. So how specific characteristics of uh, fresh fruit and veggies impact on transport operations. The problem with fresh fruit and veggies is obviously perishability. Because of that, you've got strict transport time requirements and strict temperature requirements, which makes the transport of fruit and veggies very specialized and therefore not very attractive for some transport service providers, which leads to a small number of transport operators specializing in shield transport in New Zealand, which in turn leads to the limited refrigerated tracking capacity available. And now let's have a look at the impacts on flight performance, so the top part of the current reality tree. So when roads are not available, 
and alternative roads are used, the travel distance increases, which increases the transport time. And when you combine this with the perishability issue that actually comes from here, the results are spoilage, wastage. When roads are inaccessible and transport is suspended, some deliveries have to be canceled and fresh fruit and veggies are sold to alternative markets, which means that they are not available where they are expected, which is what we call a problem of place utility in freight transport. In the same vein, when the distance traveled increases, which in turn increases the travel time, fresh fruit and veggies are not available when they are expected, which is what we call a problem of time utility in freight transport. And finally, when the travel distances and the travel times increase, you need additional resources. So for example, additional trucks or additional drivers. You also need more fuel. And all this leads to increased operational costs. So again, that's the whole current reality tree. And I realize that it is actually easier to make, to make sense of it when you see it as a whole because of the, the many interactions, but it's too small. So it's not easy to write. So that's why I presented it in segments. To recap, so we identified eight root causes. So these are the underlying systemic issues. The theory of constraints sees root causes as key leverage points for improving performance. So these are eight opportunities to increase freight resilience in New Zealand. Well, I should say seven opportunities to increase freight resilience in New Zealand because the first root cause, so the natural hazard, is beyond anyone's control. So there is not much that we can do about this. Having said that, you could argue that climate change is increasing the frequency of these events. So yes, there might be something that we can do about that. In any case, all the other root causes can be addressed in a way or another. Even perishability. So perishability can be managed with pre-cooling techniques or packaging techniques, including a number of coatings that slow down uh, spoilage. The six other root causes are related to freight transport itself, to freight policy and to freight transport operations. So this shows that Building freight resilience is a shared responsibility. There is not one magic bullet. It requires a system approach, a holistic approach that includes policy developments and operational adjustments. What's next? Well, the research that I have just presented was about establishing the value of the theory of constraints and about making sense of the complexity. The next step is about using the same tools, but this time we are applying them to a what if scenario. And the scenario is the ferry terminals in Wellington and in, in Picton are taken out by an earthquake and they are not available for three months. This could well happen. So how will freight move between the North and the South Island? And the particular focus of this study is on FMCGs. So for example, groceries. 
The idea is to identify all the constraints to establish cause and effect relationships between them, but also to identify potential solutions. So solutions to support timely deliveries between the North and the South Islands. Nathan McDonald is currently working on this project. He's uh, just starting his interviews with a broad range of stakeholders. And some of you probably had a chat with Nathan during the, the last Quaco uh, an annual meeting because Nathan talked to many, many, many different people. And that's it for me. So thank you.